Uh, hello, nice to meet you, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending the talk today. And it's a great honor to be a speaker of this wonderful programs. And thank you, uh, ACK teams and Yukako Sang and Keiko Sang for organizing this event and inviting me. And it's also a great privilege uh, to have a chance to have in conversation with Hur. Uh, someone whose uh, contribution to contemporary art I deeply respect and admire. So I'm so looking forward to hear Hura's uh, thought as well later. So we decide that I start first and who will present, then we'll have a bit of conversation and so there will be also a chance to uh, engage conversation with uh, the audience yeah, later. So the title of this talk is Current Position of Art, Universality, and Locality. And the relation between local and universal is symbolized by arrows pointing to each other, highlighting the interconnectedness. And I will explore the dynamic relation between uh, locality and universality uh, based on uh, using my recent uh, experience of curating Busan Biennale last year. And I will briefly discuss uh, my thought process behind curating the biennial and how I attempted to connect locality to the broader geographical context. So uh, whenever I have the chance to present the biennial, I usually begin by introducing the concept and framework and then before diving into the artworks. But today I uh, kind of switched things up and decided to start by offering a brief glimpse into some of the works featured in the Biennale. Yeah. This is an insulation image featuring the work of Korean artist Kim Hyun, titled Into the Light. Kim's works uh, delves into the subject of light and modernity using photography and video to connect the two. In essence, the artist explores the interplay between light, the modern infrastructure network, and the medium of photography itself. So the Kim searched through scars, uh, archival films, and photography data related to those uh, right houses in Busan. He also focused on a pivotal historical fact. Uh, Busan was the first Korean city to be connected to Japan through a submarine cable. Thus, the concept of light within this work carries several significances. It represents photographic techniques, optical cables, data conveyed through those lines, and also other modern technologies and the colonial influence of the, of the early 20th century in Busan. So with this uh, rich tapestry of historical facts and intricate layers, the artist's creative process is a fusion of archival material and the recent images that he and his collaborators have taken. The, some of these images were captured at pivotal points where the submarine cable connects the Korean Peninsula and Japan. So during the production of this work, the border between uh, South Korea and Japan, and uh, like many other countries, remained sealed due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So in response, uh, Kim collaborated with a photographer based in Japan, Hana Yamamoto. So they created a simultaneous photo session with Hama capturing images in Japan while uh, Kim taking pictures in Busan. So this synchronous work added a layer of meaning to work, bridging the physical and metaphorical distances in the face of a global health crisis. So now let's uh, shift our focus to another thought-provoking film, All That Perishes at the Edge of Land. Uh, so the front, the work in the front is uh, Megan Co by Megan Kopp, and work in the back is actually the, the installation by Hiranabi. And yeah, so we can have a more closer look. 
and her work is deeply rooted in environmental concerns, delving into the often uh, imperceptible and gradual process of bearing witness with the intent of uncovering a more expansive understanding of the contemporary world we inhabit. In this film, uh, Ocean Master, a condemned uh, container vessel, gradually reaches the shores of Gadani initiating a fictitious uh, dialogue with the workers at the Gardani ship breaking yard. The conversation oscillates between dreams and desires, revealing the structural violence embedded in the act of dismantling a ship at Gardani. Gardani stands as one of the uh, uh, South Asia's largest ship breaking sites. So Nabi adaptly uh, rings the deindustrialization process of the global north to the harsh daily realities endured by workers in the global south. This industrial activity also takes a toll on the surrounding natural landscape and ecosystems of fishing villages. <coughs> Through the poignant voiceover provided by the ship itself, which serves as the film's central character, we discover that the Ocean Master was actually made in 1995 in Jinhae in South Korea, a neighboring city of Busan. This connection between the vessel's birthplace and its eventual demise underscores the challenging working conditions and labor movement within Busan's shipbuilding yards casting a spotlight on the global implications of such processes. Busan, uh, renowned for being home to the world's sixth largest port, is also a city where the shipbuilding industry has thrived. Many dedicated individuals make, make their lives uh, in the shipyard or on fishing boats, uh, braving the seas as fishermen or seafarers. Among these uh, resilient workers in, is uh, Kim Jin Suk. Uh, at a mere 21 years of age, she shattered gender barriers uh, by becoming the first female welder uh, at Hanjin Heavy Industries, a prominent shipbuilding company in Busan. Her remarkable journey, however, was marred by her dismissal from the company in 1986 due to her involvement in union activities. For 37 years, she persisted in a battle to return to work, ultimately achieving an honorary reinstatement in 2022. So here the work uh, by uh, Che Ho Chol, shown in the biennial. The painting vividly captures a pivotal moment in 2011 when approximately 10,000 uh, people from across the nation uh, marched together and converged upon crane number 85. Uh, their purpose was to stand in solidarity with Kim Jin Suk who had taken residence on the top of this crane for an astonishing 185 days as an act of protest. Her determined protest extended to a remarkable total of 309 days, all in the pursuit of uh, justice and the reinstatement of uh, her colleagues' rate of, uh, rate of workers. This powerful visual narrative encapsulates the enduring spirit and resilience of Busan's working class heroes. Here, the last example of work depicted, depicted the Busan's uh, industry and stories with other countries and regions. Francisco Camacho Herrera is a Colombian artist who has researched how the lover Lover boom in the late 19th century in the Amazon and Congo had a direct effect on the expansion of plantations in British colonies across Southeast Asia uh, through the 1910s. This expansion in turn led to the import of rubber and founding of rubber shoe factories in Busan, 
stimulating the growth of the local footwear industry until the 90s before it gradually declined due to the relocation of the factories um, looking, which looked for cheaper labor uh, abroad. So his research resulted in creating this work, which you can see in this image, uh, the table of archives and one video narrates the rubber factory workers' protest in Busan. And the artist also uh, collaborated with the Buddhist monk painter from Korea, Bobin, to bring to life the journey of laboratory resins, illuminating their path from Latin America to Southeast Asia, and finally to Busan. So while these are just a few of the works featured in the biennial, they demonstrate how Busan's characteristics are connected not only to its neighboring country, Japan, but also to the entirety of Asia and the world. Just as ocean knows no boundaries and its waves are endless, what happens in one place is interconnected with others. Many of you uh, might already know the city of Busan. Let me just briefly uh, remind you. The Busan is the second largest city in South Korea, located on the southeastern tip of the Korean Peninsula. It has a population of a bit more than 3 million people, and, as, and it's the biggest harbor in South Korea. Busan is also the closest city to Japan, located only 50 kilometers from the nearest Japanese island, Chishima. And Korea's modern history has witnessed numerous challenges, and Busan is no exception. As a result of a forced agreement with colonial forces, the Treaty of Kangha Island in 1876, Busan became the first port open to foreign trade. Its formation and expansion as a port city since modern times have contributed significantly to how the city was shaped. Busan was useful for supplying goods, so it was developed as an industrial site accommodating factories and industrial facilities. And during the Korean War, Busan served as an interim capital of South Korea, and around uh, 500,000 refugees arrived from all over the country. So this combination of migrants from different regions has resulted uh, in a very um, uh, open hybrid city. So people think of Busan, uh, people think of the ocean when they think of uh, Busan's nature, but Busan is actually a city on the hills. Uh, because of its uh, topological characteristics as a city of hills and mountains with a narrow coastal plain, it underwent expansion and reorganization as people settled in the, in the uplands. Those settlements, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, those settlements along the slopes represent Busan's typical landscape. If Busan's narrative represents the near landscape, then the other axis of the exhibition is a perspective that zooms out to view what lies beyond Busan. It's an attempt to look at and understand Busan's history and represent phenomena happening in Asia and worldwide. This means pondering the modernity of global capitalism in the context of the city's real lives. So there, were, when he spoke about Busan as an axis of the exhibition, it was no longer adequate to refer solely to the geographical position or physical space of Busan. Rather, this Busan must be a concrete case study illustrating how its human and non-human constituents have built their lives through the complex modern history or spread out across the dynamic terrain of nature and also how this um, connects to other regions. So in this way, we can uh, conclude that local issues are not actually limited to geographic locality and that detailed, specific situations can indeed be showcased without sacrificing the kind of universality. More specifically, the four passes were taken in this biennial, 
which were also the sub-themes, migration, women and women's labor, uh, urban ecosystem, and technological changes and locality. These four areas are not separated from each other, um, but also interconnected by uh, cause and effect. The Biennale title was We on the Rising Wave, uh, referring always to the phenomenon of the wave, its rhythm, its connection, its force. We thought to translate it into connections between past and present, intersections of specific narratives and abstract forms, links between local and universal, and waves of the ocean and the mountains. So to conclude, uh, what I learned from this exhibition is the importance of connecting local narratives with global ones to build empathy um, across regions. I discovered the importance of individuals' perspectives, small stories, and their potential to become a shared understanding with a global audience. This connectivity can also serve as a reminder of everyone's social law. It's a sense of empathy that what is happening uh, in a geographical faraway place could also be mine. Uh, therefore, it can be a way to further remind us of our responsibility to the present. In this sense, I think biennials or triennales, those big uh, art exhibitions, are still an appropriate format for exploring the interconnections of multiple cities and regions. This larger scale of exhibitions uh, allow for a wider range of geographies to be studied, thus creating a more multi-layered narratives instead of focusing uh, just on one reason and one story. It expresses the complex connections in the world today. So uh, I'm going to end my presentation here, and let's now hear yeah, who speaks. Thank you. Thank you, Heiju. I'm also really happy to be speaking with uh, Heiju because we share kind of the same vision. We are interested in the same kind of work and artists that we work with. Uh, I want to thank ACK for inviting us and uh, bearing with us through uh, organizing these talks. I think uh, this format of the fair is also talks about this universality versus locality. Uh, also the way that the fair has brought booths together, international and local, is quite interesting. Uh, having us speak here as well, giving us a space to share our, uh, our voices and our stories is important. Yeah. So I wanted to acknowledge um, what is happening in Palestine right now. I think we're at an art fair, but um, our part of the world is in a very bad situation and the media is not allowing people to speak. So culture should be the safe space where people can express. Uh, media is often very much uh, um, controlled. Um, so right now Gaza is at a blackout. Journalists have been killed, assassinated, and um, there's no way for people to communicate. So I'm using my voice for the people in Palestine and Gaza. Um, I'm getting emotional, sorry. Um, this is an artist that I worked with a very long time ago. He also passed away, um, not in Palestine. He passed away for medical reasons, but um, he is a Palestinian, uh, lived in Kuwait, lived in Japan, uh, and uh, lived in the US, and is always trying to find his identity. You know, the keffiyeh scarf is a symbol of Palestine, but also a symbol of resistance when you're living under an occup occupation for 75 years and you have no home, um, and are also very much controlled by the superpowers that are um, trying to kill people's hopes and dreams. But I think places like this that bring people together are so important. So Tariq al Hussein was an artist that I uh, knew when I was uh, very young. And when I took over Sharjah Biennial, he was one of the artists that was exhibiting. And Sharjah Biennial was very much about country representation. And I looked at his work and I thought, 
that's a very complex question to put people in boxes for countries, you know. And it was very important to create a space that was truly global, that brings people together, no matter what your identity or your ethnicity. Everybody has the same struggles. Everybody wants to, you know, wake up in the morning, pay their bills, feed their children, drink water, you know, have clean water. So at the end of the day, we're all the same. And I think these kind of spaces of culture really get to you. They get to people's, whether it's music or films, or it gets to the hearts of the problem and the occasion. So I wanted to mention Tariq Al Hussein, uh, as amazing photographer. And then I also wanted to mention another Palestinian artist, Abdul Hayim Salam Zarara. Abdul Hayim Salam is actually, he passed away recently. He was living in a refugee camp in Jordan, but he was a, a Palestinian freedom fighter and a self-taught artist. Um, I did a solo show for him uh, quite a few years ago. He also participated in Sharjah Biennial, uh, also had some works at an exhibition at the New Museum. Um, he works with um, uh, mud and sawdust, and he creates these relief sculptures. Um, he has a lot of amazing work. Uh, you could uh, see his work on our website, but also see other works online. Um, he was part of a huge moment of solidarity where there was a world solidarity for everything that was happening in the world. He has an artwork about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He has an artwork about Chile. Um, and it really was a time of solidarity and they created a lot of posters from these works. So that was a little bit um, of an introduction to say, please keep Palestine in your thoughts. Please do the real research and find out what is really happening on the ground and uh, say your prayers for the nearly 8,000 people who were massacred, um, uh, 3,000 children um, uh, with white phosphorus and uh, chemical weapons. So um, I want, uh, I would hope for everybody to just send their prayers to Palestine, please. And then back to Treasure Biennial. So this is Sharjah Biennial when I was growing up, was in the uh, Trade Center, Sharjah Expo, in 1993. So this was a place where we had the book fair and all different events. It was very um, quirky, it was very cool, but this is the Biennial that I grew up with as a child, or early teen, 13. So I met a lot of artists when I was there and I knew that I wanted to be an artist. I went to art school and in 2000, and Two, um, I was in Berlin and I, uh, somebody said to me, you should go to uh, Castle to see Documenta 11. Uh, I had never been to any biennial outside of Sharjah Biennial. I didn't know what a biennial was other than Sharjah Biennial. So I visited Documenta 11, curated by Okwi Envisor, and I thought, wow, the whole world is here. This is an exhibition about a global conversation. But why is it in a German town that I've never heard of? Like, what is Kassel? You know, what, why does everybody have to go to this place? And not everybody can afford to go to Germany. So we have a space. This space should be a space to have these conversations. So in 2002, I decided to ask some questions and see, you know, what is the biennial? How does it work? And they said, yeah, you can join the committee. But I wanted to make so many changes, and they didn't want to make the changes because they were all these artists, and they were doing the same routine. You know, they put their friends, they put Egyptian minister of culture in every exhibition, and and I said, no, well, this is not what it, it should be. You know, it should be a curated exhibition. It should be a conversation. It shouldn't look like, no offense, it shouldn't look like an art fair. <laughs> it should be site specific. It needs to engage with the city, with old buildings, with you know, uh, the neighborhoods, it should be a, biennials should be a place, uh, exhibitions that reach the people, don't expect the people to come to them. Sometimes people feel like museums are only for the elites, they're not for the public, but our biennials, we have children that just come on their own, they bring their parents. That's really what a biennial can do to a city that maybe museums can't because they have a lot of different types of uh, stricter rules. So I um, took over in 2002. Unfortunately, when we were opening uh, our biennial in 2003, the war in Iraq broke out. 
So the American troops marched into Iraq just at our opening, uh, around our opening. So a lot of American artists were too scared to fly because you know, our part of the world is very dangerous and the war was happening. So a lot of other artists said, no, we stand in solidarity with the Iraqi people. Um, others Tarek's work from that first biennial, you could see. Um, he had them on light boxes as well. So this artist, Zain Mustafa, you can read a little bit here, but um, in New York, they did a protest against the war in Iraq. They did it in London. They did, I joined the one in London. They did it all over the world. In, uh, in New York, this artist, he's a Pakistani American artist. He did this thing where he took the, the Pakistani um, uh, dress, the kurtas, and had people, um, he had them hanging in the middle of the protest. So I just wanted to put this thing because it's very symbolic now, actually. Um, in 2003, that's my father signing, silence the bombs. Um, because it's, it's really important that culture is a space to demonstrate people's suffering. And I feel um, <laughs> yesterday, I think 600 troops uh, are back in Syria and back in Iraq again. So it's an endless, endless situation that has to stop. Uh, and the lies, the lies of these uh, chemical weapons that don't exist uh, also have to stop. Another artist who also did uh, an, a project to uh, reflect on the displacement of people um, was Iranian uh, artist Tarane Himami, who lives in the US. So this was also very emotional work uh, that was happening. Uh, Tariq al Hussein again, with, another, uh, with an American artist, did this project called uh, War Rooms. Uh, it, again, it's about the, the media and the judgment that happens within the Western media and what it tells you about. Uh, what is happening in certain countries, but how the media tries to control you. Um, so this was a very moving work, and it was interesting for me to reflect back on that during this time and to make the connections 20 years later. Um, so this was Okwi Envazor. He became one of the jury members in charge of Biennial, and he has been so supportive as somebody who saw that um, what we were trying to do in Sharjah was as important as what he was trying to do with his career. He opened so many doors for people of color, for us to tell our own stories in our own way and not have it narrated to us by the West uh, or, or be boxed in or categorized uh, in a way that suits them. So um, I learned a lot from Okui. Um, I invited him to curate Sharjah Biennial 15. Unfortunately, he passed away before and asked me to, to do it instead. Um, so I think voices like that are really important in, in, our, uh, in our circles. Uh, Beirut Kauchuk is a work by Marwan Rashmawi, actually Palestinian Lebanese artist living in, in Lebanon, uh, looking at the city of Beirut and uh, creating this kind of walkable city in rubber. What's interesting with this is that uh, this was later acquired by Tate Modern, so maybe you see it at Tate Modern now. Do you know that we commissioned it for the biennial? <laughs> we have also one in our collection. Um, Nari wore it, it was really interesting. Um, Nari came back in charge. I didn't put a picture of his current installation in the biennial, latest one, uh, because I didn't like the one I had on my computer. But it was interesting that in 2005, he did this project called Birdhouse. And a lot of these artists that participated at that time are now on to having you know, a new museum solo exhibition, Brooklyn solo exhibition. And what is interesting is, when you work with artists and the long-term collaborations that come out of it and to, do, and to see the journey um, nearly 20 years later. Um, when I spoke about biennials entering the cities, you could see like Hezububu Negron cigarette butt uh, rug, so working in uh, the, the marketplace, working in different site-specific places. Another artist, so I'm putting a lot of artists that I, that, I was, uh, that I worked with who we lost. So Amal Qinawi passed away um, from cancer a very long time ago. We did a solo show for her, but this was one of her strongest works, which was this uh, um, performance that she did called Nonstop Conversation, where she wrapped this building uh, with these uh, padded mattresses. She was very much uh, talking about women's issues and uh, talking about also her, her 
a story behind her illness that uh, was taking over her with the cancer. Um, and she does these beautiful animations as well, uh, drawings and animations. Uh, we're working on a publication for her now. Mona uh, Hatoum. So this was the. So when I took over Sharjah Biennial, the, ex, the expo center was not in. The Biennial wasn't going to be in the tent anymore. There was a new, a large new um, exhibition center that was taking place. So this was the space, but I had so many problems with the space. First of all, they were very difficult to work with, and every time we had a problem, they kept telling me. Yeah, but we're giving you the space for free, so you better <laughs> appreciate it. So I said, OK, I won't come back. <laughs> and now they said, when are you going to use the space? I said, I'm not using it anymore. This was the last time we used it, in 2006. Because I found it also very isolating. Next, we're in one hall, and the next hall, there's a jewelry exhibition. And the next hall, so it's trade. It's a trade center, a trade fair. And I didn't want to put art into that thing because um, we're, not, it's not, we're not selling the art. This is a biennial. It's a different type of conversation. So this was the last time we used the building. Uh, Thomas Saraceno was there. Um, Halal Kosi, this is a work we did in the museum. This work was acquired by Tate, but I don't think they've ever shown it. I haven't seen it on display. Uh, but they bought it after we um, uh, commissioned it for the biennial. Um, Basma Sharif, another artist, uh, talking about the distance from Gaza to uh, Jerusalem and other places. It's called We Began by Measuring Distance. Uh, a lot of the artists that we worked with also continue to come and um, be um, artists in residence. And also, uh, we have a production program grant to help them produce new work. Uh, Sharif Wakid, this is an old work, and this was shown in a Mori exhibition uh, called um, Ara uh, Arab, Arab Express? No, Arab, I forgot now. It was uh, Fumio's exhibition on uh, the Arab world. It was a long time ago, but they showed this work. So basically, it's also about misrepresentation, and uh, this famous uh, actor is reading. Uh, he has a gun, he has a map behi um, flag behind him, but actually what he's reading is uh, one, 1001 Arabian Nights. And it's about the story behind 1001 Arabian Nights and this prolonging, this waiting, trying to uh, make their life last longer by, re by reading the story. So this was also acquired by Tate Modern. We have a copy as well. Um, but yeah, it was also shown in, in uh, the Mori exhibition a long time ago. I don't remember the date. Uh, NS Harsha, Nations, uh, sorry, I put a lot of text here. Um, this was a really interesting project. Uh, the area there we're in, Sharjah, has a lot of uh, tailors. So a lot of people were, uh, uh, you could hear the tailors like ch -ch 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 behind the office. So we worked with the local tailors to create this installation, which was really beautiful, talking about nationalism and flags and nations and what does that mean. Um, another project which was ongoing at CAMP. CAMP is a collective from India. So we, where our office is, actually where that ladder is on the top, uh, the two little windows on the left are my, my office over there, that little building on the top. I have the little room that's hidden. But that used to be uh, more of a cafe, and they used the rooftop to look over to the ocean, and that's where the sailors dock their ships. So Sharjah is very much an important trade route. So we have all these big old ships coming from Somalia, from India, bringing everything, anything you can think of. So we did this project in collaboration with the sailors. And they continued to do this project. This, uh, we did a radio station called Radio Mina. And then, uh, and then, oops, hang on. I can go back one. And then the project became um, a film. Uh, for Yuko, uh, that was shown in Yuko Hasegawa's Biennale. Um, this was a work by uh, Slavs and Tartars called Fr uh, Friendship of Nations. Uh, I put this picture because you could see all the, the, art world, uh, the art world coming to Sharjah to pick artists for their exhibitions, which I thought was funny. So you see Catherine David, Glenn Lowry, uh, Peter Ely, Dorian Chung, everybody, which was quite hilarious, with our local guys hanging out down there. Um, after this, Slavs and Tartars got a little exhibition at MoMA, which was quite nice. Uh, so it was really important for us that 
actually Sharjah Biennial is a space where artists can also get um, their work seen and have, go on to have exhibitions in other places in the world. Um, uh, Imran Qureshi did this project, uh, about uh, Blessings Upon the Land of My Love. This was done, um, it was during the Arab Spring, but he was doing it, uh, talking about um, a bombing that happened in the marketplace in Lahore. Uh, so it's about the place that he loves and witnessing this like massive suicide bomb that took place. So if you get close, they're actually really beautiful flowers that are painted. He's a miniature painter. But then where the drain is in the middle, it's almost like blood going down. It worked really well here. Um, it, it, the work went to be shown again on the rooftop of the Met and other places. Um, I think um, space, uh, site specificity is very important. I don't think the message was the same on the rooftop of the Met than in this kind of place. He also did it in uh, Sydney Biennial uh, on Cockatoo Island, and it made sense there because of the violence that happened over there, the historic violence. Uh, Wa'al Shauki, this, this was part of also the uh, biennial that Yuko Hasegawa curated in 2013. Uh, Wa'al was in residence in Sharjah with this project where he worked with a lot of the uh, tec technicians and uh, technical staff at the Sharjah Art Foundation and asked them to uh, create a script, uh, to create lyrics uh, from um, uh, art world kind of like, uh, uh, what is it called? Institutional um, uh, statements, like it's a, like a, what was the word? I'm losing my words in English now. Um, almost like institutional um, frameworks, but turn it into a, a song. And they were interested in Qawali music because most of them are from Pakistan. So they worked with Qawali musicians to create this performance. I didn't put any videos, but all links are available on our website. So that was the image I was looking for. So the work with the sailors continued to create another project, which was called From Gulf to Gulf to Gulf, where the artists worked with the local, uh, with the sailors to film their own journeys on their mobile phones, and they created a film. And we showed it right on the, so where the, where the light lamppost is, that's where the ships come, literally just there. So we created a little cinema, and they would come every day, watch themselves, while well, their families would come, and it really garnered a lot of, uh, a lot of crowds. So in, uh, again, with uh, the biennial that you co-curated, uh, Sharjah Biennial 11, she invited Apichat Pond, Versatakul, to create a cinema. So he worked with uh, Ole Shirin, an uh, architect who he worked with before. To, the, to make a cinema that looks like a rooftop, because the, our old uh, buildings and the old houses look like this. So you're almost imagining you're on the rooftops of buildings. This area was meant to be our phase two of construction, but when we got this cinema, we couldn't, we couldn't let it go. So it's our permanent cinema now. Uh, that wall is the building of our exhibition space. Um, this is another building is the Kalba Ice Factory on the East Coast. Um, so we always like to use buildings before they uh, get renovated. So I'm going to go quickly here because I'm taking too long. So these are the, the new buildings that we built around the old city. And you could see the sea. So this is kind of one of the, the main sites where we grew from. Um, universality versus locality. So look, I'm always interested in local buildings with history because when you work with an exi existing building, it's already in people's history and in their minds. When you build a new building, you're starting from scratch. So I'm known for uh, scouting a lot of old buildings and repurposing them. This was an old, um, actually it used to be a French bakery in the 70s. Then it became a supermarket when I was a child and then it became another supermarket, and then it became a fast food chicken place, and then Sharjah Art Foundation. So we renovated it. This is the second renovation. So we created a little piazza. When we did the first renovation, it was only the building. I really wanted to turn it back into its brutalist concrete shell. But all the local people that live in the neighborhood sent me messages on Instagram. Oh, you should open a coffee shop there. I thought, but I removed the chicken place because I want an open exhibition space. But obviously, if people living there saying we want a cafe, maybe we can go under because I thought there was, I think there was storage underneath. There wasn't a whole floor underneath, but we dug, it took us two years, we dug under 
and we have a cafe and this is an old picture but we have like a library reading room and instead of it being a dark basement we have a little garden like a sunken garden and it's a very popular space now uh, students come to work there this is a building that i've been trying to renovate for the longest time but i my budget uh, request keeps getting rejected. Uh, but it was a privately owned cinema. Now uh, we own it, uh, and artists have done research in it. We've done uh, uh, one performance that we did in there. It's the old cinema um, on the East Coast in the mountain area. This is not the best picture, but the projection that you'll see is actually Taro Shinoda's uh, performance of the moon that he did in Sharjah with Uriel Barthelemy. But what I liked about this photo is that it really shows a space of people coming together. And it was a very magical moment of seeing the moon uh, over the desert. I think it was really beautiful. Uh, we had a lot of spaces that we turned into public guard, community gardens, which was important. Uh, I'm going to move quickly because I haven't even reached Sharjah Biennial 15. This is Sharjah Biennial 15. Uh, Tanya Al-Khouri talking about power in Lebanon, power as in electricity, and then power as in who holds the power. Uh, Faustan Liankula talking about restitution in Africa, and uh, it was a work inspired when he was in residence at the Met, and he found some of the statues at the Met from his family's ancestry uh, back in the Congo. Um, uh, Black Grace, a dance company from New Zealand. Actually, they are Samoan, Samoan and Maori. Um, this is a new commission we did for Sharjah Biennial called Paradise Rumor, uh, talking about um, the Pacific Islands and uh, the biennial title is Thinking Historically in the Present. So thinking about the history of the, uh, the Pacific Islands of extraction of colonialism, but now the uh, current issues of um, people in New Zealand and Australia talking about uh, Pacific labor being a strain on their government. Um, uh, UAE artists and musicians, again, talking about the co connection between East Africa and the UAE. Uh, our music in the UAE is African music. People assume uh, it's Arabic. Maybe the music is like Egypt. We're very different from Egypt and the other Arab countries. We have the Oud but we also have the drums, and we have the beat, and we have all the instruments that they use in East Africa. So this is something that's all come through the, the, the trade, through the boats, through the spice trade. Um, so that's really important to bring these connections together. Uh, this is a talk in the marketplace with Joy Minaya talking about uh, artworks like uh, the islands and exoticizing Caribbean islands. I'm gonna stop now. And this is Gabriela Golder looking at the um, the protests in Chile, in Hong Kong, in many places where uh, police target, yes, police target the eyes. So it's called uh, tear out the eyes. Um, and it was very interesting to, to hold this uh, performance. But she worked with students of the Academy for Performing Arts. Um, and then uh, uh, Michael Rakovitz talking about the history of his family as a, a Iraqi Jews leaving Iraq and what it means to uh, leave Iraq and uh, leave the industry, the date industry that they had. Uh, and John Akamfra's installation, uh, just because it looks really great, I wanted to end with this photo. I think that was it. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, that was 20 years of history into one. Wow. <laughs> it's so it's so great to hear like the trajectory of uh, Shahzad Bayanir from you. And also thanks for speaking out about this imminent and important issue of today's, what is happening in the world today. And it really connects and relates to the topic we are talking. Yeah, I mean, I had the chance to see this year the Shahzad Bayanir you curated. I visited once before, but this time I noticed you actually expand the buy-in year to five different cities in the country. So I mean, well, it's I mean, as a uh, organizer, it's a challenging, and also it risks that risky because as it's so expanded, some audience might not have the to 
couldn't see all the venues. But I felt like I, I really enjoyed the trip between the cities. So then I could uh, understand a bit better the landscapes. And for me, as I presented, landscape, the nature, is very important to understand the life of the cities, people's way of life and thinking. So I think it also affects a lot on the exhibition itself. So I, I wanted to hear why you decided <laughs> to why, what was your what led to your decision to expand uh, the exhibition's special scope to such an extent, and which part of Sharjah you wanted to share with the audience yeah, out of this exhibition context? Yeah, thanks. That's a yeah, good question. So for me, it was doing the biennial in Sharjah was always about decentering the biennial, right? So decentering and then decentering from the center. But I, what I noticed in Sharjah, when we have a lot of festivals, they do the main one in the city and then something small in this village, something small in that village. And I think that's not fair. Does that mean that the people in this area get you know, better education because they've, they've uh, witnessed so many more events? Do they have to make the trip? Why does the, don't the others make the trip that way? You know? So I, I felt it wasn't fair, and also at the same time, I didn't want to just do something simple in these places. No, I wanted to take a very special building in their town and make it be like, oh, this is our space. So the factory is in one town. This is, it's called Kalba Ice Factory. Um, the clinic is in another town. Um, uh, another studio is in another town with an old government building. So each one has its town, and they're very proud of their art space and their exhibition space. And also, another thing for me, and, and each one had a lot of artists, because I noticed as we visit Biennial, some people say, oh, there's only one artist there, I don't have time to go. But no, you, you, can't, you can't choose, because each one, and each one has one, like one or two very well-known artists. You know? So oh, you have to drive two hours to see Doris Salcedo and Nari Ward and Ibrahim Mahama. So, oh, you have to go. Oh, you have to go the other way, because you know, Kerry James Marshall and you know, Veronica Ryan. So it was really interesting that people made the effort to go everywhere. But also what was really important for me is I kept hearing a lot of people saying, oh yeah, I visited Sharjah, yeah, yeah, just uh, the museum. And I was like, that's not Sharjah, that's just my office and that's just the, the first space, you know. The biennial is so much more than that. And I wanted people to experience the journey as part of the biennial. So you drive through desert, mountain, and sea, yeah. Yeah, so since we don't have much yes, we time, I, I would just to ask one okay. more question. So, yeah. yeah, you have been traveling to various countries, and now you, you recently finished several projects, but also you're working on uh, new projects, exhibition in Japan as well. And whenever you go, you immerse yourself in the country by yourself, yeah. <laughs> alone. <laughs> and then, uh, I don't know how you are in the in in between different cultures and you're experiencing uh, uh, differences, but also maybe the connections as yeah. well. So, uh, considering to our subjects today, uh, have you noticed any connections between these uh, in intercultural connections and shared issues among the places you've recently traveled, yeah. and what is the most yeah their biggest issue or concern yeah. to yeah, experience through these travels. Yeah, so recently I opened uh, two exhibitions in September, one in Paris, one in Tunis. And they seemed very similar because they, they were talking about similar issues, like the migration of North African workers to uh, France, and then the racism and migration and labor. And then I really wanted to talk about the current situation with uh, uh, sub-Saharan migrants uh, coming into Tunis and the racism that they are also facing there. So it was important to do talks and screenings around that in Tunis because if something happens at a government level, that's not how the people feel and the people were very upset. So it was important to have the space to have these discussions. So 
I like it to very much relate to the place, but there's always, I mean, the world is so connected. There's so much that is, that is similar. And what I find about Aichi Triennial, which I, I really, uh, re it resonates with me because Aichi has an exhibition in, in Nagoya and then another city. Um, so this idea is really important and I feel like it, feel, it makes it very inclusive that you know, every edition, some other uh, city in uh, Aichi gets to be part of it, um, which is really special. So I don't know if you read the announcement. We're in Seto City on the 13th of September, 2025. Save the dates. I'm going to see everybody there. <laughs> So I wanted to um, also mention that uh, Heiju's curating the Singapore Pavilion in the next Venice Biennial. So if you're going to be in Venice, uh, it'll be great for you to yeah, also I'll see, see that. you all there too. Yeah. <laughs> and we have, we have about seven minutes for questions. I'm sorry, I went over. Are there any questions from anyone? If not, we're good. If not, I have a question for you. If not, I have a question for, uh, for Heiju. Um, Heiju, you just moved to Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, what was interesting is that you just moved to Singapore to work at Singapore Art Museum, but you were selected to curate the, uh, the Singapore Pavilion yeah. uh, with an amazing artist. So could you tell us a little bit about the, not whatever you can tell us about the uh, process? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I moved to Singapore this um, February. And I didn't, of course, expect to work for the Singapore Pavilion. But after uh, staying in two months, around two months later, uh, I got this invitation of working for Singapore Pavilion, which I've never imagined, <laughs> and greatly surprised. And the process is that in Singapore's case, uh, the, the committee select the artist first, and then the artist invite the curator. But of course, the uh, artist uh, has, has to have an agreement with organizers and then commissioners to work with the designated curators. And I w just merely arrived. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, it was. For me, a good sign that the, nowadays the pavilions, the Venice pavilions, uh, are challenging these boundaries of, of national boundaries and more open to the um, expertise of the curator and focusing how to help and how to make a good exhibition for the artist. So, for instance, the Japan Pavilion uh, invited the Korean curator and Korean Pavilion. Uh, one of the Korean Pavilion curator is also from abroad, and, the, and also I'm working for Singapore. So, uh, beyond these national yeah, boundaries, uh, maybe I have a hope that uh, the Venice Pavilions pavilions can have a place for more uh, like, um, harmonized yeah. yeah, space instead of being in competitions between the countries and um, put a more voice on the important issues that we can speak out in the world today and more focus on artists' own production and help them to uh, yeah, have their best in the exhibitions. Yeah. So I'm yeah, greatly surprised and yeah, honored and yeah, trying to do my best to make a um, yeah, good exhibition with Robert Zhao on yeah. here. Yeah. He's a great artist. Thank you. I don't know if we have any questions. We have like four minutes. Otherwise, we can wrap up. I have, one. Oh, I have two questions. Go ahead. Nihongo Ego. Ego. Um, thank you for a great, great presentation. Um, I want to just ask, like, uh, have you, like, t today's, like, uh, topic is, like, localization in the, uh, un un universality. Yeah, universalization. So have you, like, feel, like, when, like, in process to come to Japan, or even, like, alive in Japan, have you feel, like, something about, like, localization in the, like, um, sorry, universalization? It's you, hard for me yeah. because I studied Japanese 20 years ago, so I've been coming to Japan for yeah, a long time. Yeah, yeah, but like uh, just for, uh, I, you, you I, stay a long time here. Hi. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, but like, uh, you know, so for, for you, for example, yeah. like uh, if you stay 
yeah. in Japan, yeah. you feel like. I feel like it's else? changed a lot in the last 20 years. When I used to come, mm -hmm. it was better practice for me because nobody spoke English. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. And I felt really kind of, I, uh, I felt at home because I was, you know, I was a student, I was studying the language. Mm -hmm. um, but now more and more people are coming, which is great for the economy, but it's also, very, it's, especially after the pandemic, I feel like uh, many, many tourists are here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it has changed a lot, but I felt that, it, that those are tourists that are coming mm -hmm. rather than the cultural activities. The, mm -hmm. In Japan, the cultural activities seem to always look west. Yeah. Sometimes they look at some so, yeah. Southeast Asia bit, bit, around, yeah. but not so much in the Middle East, sorry, the colonial term, Middle mm -hmm. East or Africa yeah. or West Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that's the space that needs to be worked on some more. Of course, Mami's exhibition in the Aichi Triennial had a lot of artists. And, uh, the, and actually, Aichi Triennial, since the beginning, had a lot of artists also from Palestine and other places. So I think um, that's something that would be different. Yeah, yeah totally agree. So keep Sorry. going. Thank you. I think we have two minutes. <laughs> Sorry. I'll be very quick. First of all, thank you for uh, this year's edition of the Sharjah Biennial. It was such a special experience. And what I mostly appreciated also is how you gradually allow the visitors to discover site after site and also the, the different strata of nature, geology. And I felt the, the opening days, they were almost like a, like a ritual, you know, yeah. that you can't just consume the art, but yeah. there, there is a you know, specific context and concentration. So I just wanted to hear a bit more from you about the importance of ritual in yeah. your curatorial activity. So I postponed the biennial by two years, you know, and I added an extra month because I feel like everything is happening too quickly. People need to spend time with art, take time. I had very long films, and I remember one artist saying, oh, you have a lot of films. Should I make my film shorter if people don't have time? I said, if they don't have time, they don't have to watch it. There are people who live here who are coming every weekend, and they want to watch your film. And your film's not only going to be shown here, it's going to be shown in other places. Maybe it'll be shown in a film festival. So don't let compromise your work because of one event. Do what you want to do, and make the best work that you can do for this project, because this is where you have the funding for it, and this is where it's going to be seen. Uh, the work was then, sh it was Alina Mota, it was then shown in Sao Paulo Biennale, and so it, it went off to do a lot of, uh, great thing. So I feel like that was important, taking time. Um, and that's what I'm hoping to do also for Aichi. I don't want people to like rush, try to see everything really quickly because mentally it's exhausting trying to see too much. And also, you know, artists spend time creating work, curators spend time researching work, and then the consumer consumes it like this. They look at it and they're like, okay, I've seen it. And I've had ar some artists say, oh, uh, the, the statistics are people have this many uh, minutes to look at artwork. I don't care about statistics. Not everybody is the same. People are people. You know, maybe I want to sit and watch. I went to the ambient Tokyo for Sakamoto and uh, Takatani's work. You know, you spend like an hour there. You know, so I think it's important to let the work speak for itself, and people take time. If you're traveling, understandably, but biennials are about the local audience more than anything, because this is their space, their home and they can come back and bring their families and friends. Okay, I think we're on time. Sorry, a little bit of Arabic uh, style and Japanese style, we're on done. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for coming. Uh, thank you so much. I'm afraid the time has come to conclude this session. So at ACK Talks, uh, we have uh, remaining today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, we have uh, different programs. Uh, and also, these uh, ACK Talks are available online as well. So please enjoy uh, them. So once uh, again, Fool Al Kashimi san and Kim Heju san, thank you very much uh, for your uh, excellent talks.